Hi, David. Hey, Jennifer. How are you? All right. How are you? I thought I had a meeting with you with Eric Mullen. Was that right? Um, uh, Brian Nettle, I think. No, no I, I know about this. Yeah, oh, we met. Yes, we we spoke when I on on the meeting with Eric. Yes, absolutely. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Yeah. I was trying to put a face with the name and I finally done that. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for agreeing to uh, help out with this presentation. Oh, yeah. Uh, not a problem at all. Brian's going to do the first half of it, and then I'm going to do the second half. Sounds perfect. And I'm going to let you guys go ahead and uh, share your screen, and then I'll just post both of the slide presentations after um, okay. it, it's over. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's not he's not here yet, so. Okay, that's fine. We still have a few minutes. Hi, Don, <laughs> if you're here. Yeah. I'm here. How are you? Yeah, All right. How are you? I'm I'm doing okay. It's the Good. first day of classes for us here. Oh boy, yeah. I yeah. know it. It's a busy it time. Does. Yes. I it feels good though to shut my door for a minute. So there you go. <laughs> tell on me. Shh. <laughs> I won't tell. I won't tell. No. It's, All right. It's like, you know, we're we're having to get like because we don't meet so often in yeah, January. Hello, hello. Hello, hey, hello. Hello. How are you? Good to hear. We we avoid meeting in uh in December. And so it seems like in these last couple weeks of January, we have to get like a month and a half's worth of meetings in, yeah. in two weeks. So <laughs> I I understand. It's it's like, you know, we we work shortened hours in the summer, but I wonder if we really do. Because <laughs> everything's squeezed in mm -hmm. so tightly, and the other times it's like I don't know if we really came out on the good end of that deal, but you know. <laughs> well, on a on a summer on a four o'clock on a summer yeah. afternoon, you probably feel pretty good about That's it. That's right. Who wants to be here on a Friday afternoon? I mean, <laughs> great people are popping on. We have a lot of people um, scheduled to join this meeting, so we'll we'll expect um, a pretty big group. Great. Hi, Daisy. Hi, Jenny. Just want to say hello. Hello, hello. Good to see you. Thank you. So good to see you. And thanks for all your help lately. Oh, you're welcome. Anytime, please. Hi, yeah, Steve. Should be, yeah, it should be a big help to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought we were just using you, but you're helping everybody. <laughs> no, you're all, you all are, um, you're we're most this is what my my favorite part of my job is working with colleges yeah. so good hi david oh a beard <laughs> for a while i'm not sure you had it last time i saw you so maybe it's been a while Jenny, you said you're gonna share the screen on the PowerPoint. When it comes to when you're at your um when you we okay. get to your part, I will invite you to share your screen. Okay. Uh okay. All right. Yeah. Brian's Brian's gonna share the screen, our screen okay. PowerPoint we I, have. I will invite Brian to do that. I have some slides to go through first and then okay. I'll turn it yeah. over to you. Perfect. Yeah. Let me see if Brian's here yet. Don't see him yet. If he don't pop on now, I'll, I'll we we can get going. Um, okay, that's fine. We're gonna um, it, like I say, I've got I've got a few minutes to talk, so he has time to get on. Um, so no, no worries. We're going to be fine. And he also sent me the slides, which I'm sure, you know, cause you were on this, the, yeah, yeah, I email. Saw that. so if you, I saw if you need them. Yeah. Hey everyone. And welcome. Thanks for, uh, ending your Tuesday with us. We're going to 
and we have a pretty big group, so I'm going to wait a few more minutes for people to join. We have two minutes to the top of the hour. We'll probably get started one or two minutes after. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. <clears throat> There's Brian. All right, good. I was, uh, I was telling David, I have some slides to go through first before I turn it over to you guys. Thanks everybody who's joining. Um, we're gonna, we have a big, I'm expecting a big group, so I'm going to give it another one or two minutes. Hi, Lewis. Good to see you. Hey, Doc. Hey, Lewis. <laughs> Hi, Jenny. Hey, everybody. Hi, Amy. Uh, <laughs> good to see you, Doc. <laughs> you too, man. All right, I have 401, just about to be 402. And I'm gonna go ahead in the interest of time, we have a lot to cover and um, we are recording. Um, so although some people may still be joining a little bit later, I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off. Hello and welcome. Um, for those of you who I do not know, I am Jenny Shanker. I am the Senior Director of Learning and Research at the Michigan Community College Association <laughs> Center for Student Success. Um, exciting to uh, get started on our projects for 2023 and um, among them, this legislative program, the Academic Catch-Up Program. Um, so we're gonna do um, we got we got a pretty packed agenda, and so we're going to do some a little uh, introductions in chat, um, and talk about the program, the requirements of the program, a little bit about the funding. We're going to see an example of the program from our colleagues at GRCC. Uh, talk a little bit about the application process and where you can find information and resources about the program. So we're going to do all that really fast. Um, go ahead and rename yourself if you have not done so to include your college so that um, when you're speaking or asking a question, people can see where you are from. Um, and also, if you don't mind saying hello and adding your name, college, and role in the chat, um, just this is useful to us, not only for everyone to see who's here, but also because then we can capture that chat and see a program like this um, 
impacts so many different departments across the college, and it's very interesting to see who is here to learn more about it. So I know we've got faculty here, just from, you know, I know we've got counselors and advisors here. Um, we have administrators here. So looking, um, you know, kind of interesting to see here across the, uh, the spectrum of roles at our colleges. Um, grab your fries, because we're gonna be talking about academic catch up. Um, the uh, 2023 budget um, allocated 10 million for this academic catch-up program, um, and it was to support to support community colleges in offering programs to combat learning loss among recent high school graduates, particularly aimed at those who experienced interruptions um, due to the COVID-19 pa pandemic. Um, all. MCCA colleges, all 31 of our public and tribal community colleges are encouraged to apply for this funding. Um, it's gonna be distributed according to a funding formula that we'll talk about later. Um, and it, all colleges are eligible to receive funding and we anticipate that everyone who applies for funding will receive some. Um, the other thing in the legislation, uh, we have a small work group that uh, helped us to design um, some of the components of the program. And it included the following members. These slides are gonna be available to you afterwards. So I'm not gonna walk through who all these people are, but there was there were requirements that, that small colleges, large colleges, um, uh, K-12 uh, all be represented, MCAN 60 by 30. So we had uh, a good representation across all of the required groups. And we thank that group for their work and the next step of their work, which will be to help us to review the applications when they come in. So the requirements for participating in the program, and these are from, this is right from the legislation. First, you have to submit an application. We'll talk about how you're gonna do that. Um, you need to offer a summer educational program focused on English and mathematics uh, to any incoming college student it, that is free of charge to the student. It needs to be a free of charge program. Um, when the students complete the program, you need to, and they enroll for the fall semester, you need to uh, enroll them either directly into college level gateway English or mathematics, or into co-requisite courses supporting English and mathematics, gateway English and mathematics. You cannot enroll students after they complete this program in any standalone developmental education class. Um, you need to be able to provide transportation support and classroom supplies, um, including access to a laptop, internet access, and all technical um, support during the program. Provide both in-person and online instruction options, which may be um, a hybrid. Uh, delivery, individualized support for career exploration, admission, and financial aid, and support for student ba basic needs, um, definitely including food assistance, but that's not the limit of the basic needs that you can support as part of this program. I'm going to pause and check the chat to see if there's anything, any questions looking like most of these are introductions. Yep, great. I don't think we've had any questions come in in the chat, Jenny. Oh, great. I forgot to mention that I'm joined by my awesome colleague, Erica Oriens, um, who will be helping monitor chat and jumping in if I say anything wrong. Um, so the funding, we worked a lot on this funding formula. It is it is based on the uh, budget that uh, GRCC used for its program, which is what this legislative program is designed to emulate. Um, so every college is going to be uh, eligible for base funding of $83,000 per institution, and then a per student allocation per student based on the total targeted number of students that we expect you to be able to serve with your program. Um, you could, I'll show you later where you can see how much funding your pro, your college is, is anticipated to be eligible for.
Correct, Michael. They do not have to be 2023 graduates. Any incoming college student is eligible. Okay. Now, having given you that preliminary information, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to allow Brian and David from GRCC to um, take over and tell us about the GRCC Bridges to College Raider Ready program. Thank you, Jenny. I'm gonna share my screen here. Am I sharing my screen, Jenny? Can you see it? Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everybody. Happy to be here with you this afternoon. We're going to go through um, an overview of the Bridges to College Reader Ready program that GRCC put together. Um, just kind of one example of, of what a program like this um, can look like. So our specific program actually began in the summer of 2020. Uh, we had been doing some summer programming prior, but it had been really focused on junior high students associated with another grant that we were getting. But with the pandemic and the emergence of discussions around learning loss and the disruption that we all saw across um, K-12 and higher ed, the opportunity to build this program presented itself through just that um, uh, opportunity and also some underspending in some other areas of the college and um, using her funds to offset some other expenses. We were able to not only build but fund a pretty substantial program. Um, so late spring, we decided we were going to build something, and I asked Dave Selman, my colleague who is on this call and will be co-presenting with me, um, to build something in very short order. We really put up the first summer session in um, a couple of months' time. Um, I just want to share that as we begin to talk a little bit about what our program is, there's multiple ways to build one of these programs, lots of national models. Um, Dave and I and some others on our team actually did a little bit of research to see what some best practices were for um, some of these programs. So this is ours, but um, as you can well imagine, based on your school and your community and um, different models, uh, various things can work. For us, we ended up with a five-week um, hybrid program. Um, it was hybrid for a couple of reasons. First, necessity um, drove the hybrid. We were still having quite a bit of COVID protocols. Um, so in order to split up the class sizes, um, we built it hybrid, but also we thought um, knowing we wouldn't be coming back to normal in-person instruction for quite some time, um, um, providing students with support in learning in a hybrid environment was important. So we kind of embedded that as an essential skill um, in the learning process. And we found we, it, worked, it worked really well. Um, and we also knew we wanted to focus on math uh, writing and reading. We all know those are critical areas um, for success for entry into and, and through college. Um, so that was what we had wanted to build, again, based on our needs and what we were seeing in some other programs across the nation. We identified three very broad um, program goals. Um, we certainly wanted to improve students' skills, but also confidence in, a set, in, set, in essential subject areas like math, reading, and writing. Um, we certainly wanted to address um, some of the skills, but we also knew that confidence was going to be um, a big factor um, with the learning loss and the disruption. Um, we knew in a five-week time frame we would only be able to make up so much um, of that, but certainly focusing on students being a little bit more confident, getting them a little bit more into the pattern of learning again was a big goal that we had set out for ourselves and actually measured it as part of our program. We also wanted to help students gain college knowledge and work with them to complete paperwork and other requirements for admission area to post-secondary pursuits, whether that was a FAFSA, an admissions application. When we did this in the first year, we opened it up like this program to any student that was interested. We did do it in, this, um, in the last couple of summers and we were more focused on students who were interested in attending um, GRCC. So I'm actually glad to see that the legislation went towards a broader open appeal. And then one of our other program goals was to connect them with success resources at GRCC. 
sometimes we found among our high school students, there was a fear or a perception that support services went away once you left high school. And we wanted to make sure that as part of this program, we connected them to our tutoring, our, our um, success coaches to let them know that if they were to come to GRCC, they would have access to those. Um, we ran two sessions because it was five weeks. It allowed us to run two sessions. So we ran um, two of them at, in the early summer and then later summer. And we ran, were able to run one at our downtown campus and at our Lakeshore. So we actually ran four total sessions, two at downtown, two at Lakeshore. I want to provide just a little bit before I turn this over to David to talk a little bit about what those students experienced during those five weeks. I want to provide a little bit of what we um, use for a, a budget. Um, I provided just a general breakdown just because you know we ran it a few different summers. Our funding stream was a little bit different, um, but this provides just kind of a general overview of how our money was spent. We did spend about 50% of our um, money on salaries for staff um, to run it, uh, coordinators, navigators, and we wanted the instruction. We were using language about instruction in math and English. And so once you start talking about that and building our, um, our model, we, you know, we were subject to our faculty contract and other contracts on campus for pay. Um, so 50, about 50% of our budget went to pay, and then you can see uh, the breakdown um, of how we spent the rest of our, of our money here. And again, it varied a few percentage points here and there, depending on what we did. Um, but this is a pretty consistent average across the few summers that we, that we ran this. I'm going to turn it over um, to my colleague, Dave Selman, who is our Dean of Strategic Outreach at the college, who really, as I said, put this program together at our request in pretty um, short order, and then over time has been able to refine it and develop it um, as we've done it the last couple of summers. So um, Dave, take it away and just let me know when you want, to advance, want me to advance the slide. You're muted, Dave. Sorry about that. Um, um, I'm gonna run us through, the, run us through. The, what the day the days would look like. Uh, as far as we would start off with uh, with breakfast about eight fifteen to nine, and and we would most of that time students would come in. They'd probably eat in about five minutes, and then we use the rest of the time to check in with the navigators. And um, and and what we had our navigators do is uh, the navigators would if they would they would really take attendance at breakfast, and so if they wasn't there, they wasn't there, we'd call them. And we really, we really made a big deal out of attendance. Matter of fact, we put percentage points on everything: attendance, uh, parent participation, the uh, the the um, the, app, the after class activities that we done, the enrichment things, and so everything had percentages on it. So they would lose money if they wouldn't attend things. So uh, we would go Mondays. We would do from nine to eleven. We would do um, we would do English on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We would do. Uh, 9 to 11, we do math. So we sort of broke that up. Um, and sort of the afternoon thing, uh, if we had a we if we had a financial aid workshop, what we would do is we would have the students go to a large room, we'd bring them all together and, and we'd have someone from financial aid or advising or counseling come in and, and they would talk to them about that pro those processes. Um, so that's kind of what the, the week would look like for five weeks. If we would do this for five weeks, we would not have any class on Fridays. Um, and then if we had any afternoon, if we took them on any trips or visited different buildings or different places in town, we would we would do that around 12. We, we would feed them lunch. So we'd have breakfast every morning, regardless. And then we would only feed them lunch when we had an afternoon activity. Does that make sense to everybody? So they wouldn't get lunch unless they had, unless they were lunch, we were taking a trip somewhere, like going to the movies and or doing some of those team building kinds, kinds of things or having uh uh, a, a visit from a, like student life office and and tutoring services and uh, maybe a success coach disability services or we done health uh, any of those type of things we would we'd feed them lots because we keep them longer. Uh, Brian, why don't you go to the next screen, please? Okay, so things the program would provide we would provide a bus pass. We would give them a month. We would get we'd get monthly bus passes for them. So that that would that would actually allow them to catch and go home, come go to school and go home uh, for about for about almost uh, what about thirty about 
the whole duration of the program. So all they need is one monthly bus pass promise, and we would show them how to catch the bus for those that were unfamiliar with the, how the bus transportation worked. So majority of our students were, uh, what we found out, were, were dropped off by their parents. Okay. Um, or that, you know, we didn't give up. Who's that asking there? Okay, Barbara, we did not give any uh, allowances for gas or anything like that. We just or provide gas cars. We just would provide bus pass if they needed it, and or if their parents would. Most of the kids' parents dropped them off. What we found out, but we did have the bus passes for them if they needed them. Uh, we provided daily breakfast. This was very important. Um, uh, the 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 breakfast. We we, we encourage the kids to come in, not to eat at home, but to eat here because we wanted them not to waste the food, and we provided a, a light breakfast in most cases for them, and they. Um, and they really, uh, they really, they really enjoyed it. I mean, it really, I think it really made a difference because some kids did not have breakfast, as you guys know. Uh, lunch was only provided for those students, uh, for the students uh, that um, that had afternoon activities. So some students, we wouldn't take them all because we had over 100 some students in the program. So we'd take maybe you know 25 of them uh, to you know. Uh, to after school, to afternoon activity, and so the rest of them would just go home. But we provide lunch for those who who were staying. So uh, again, that was important because it was a long day for those students. Um, classroom supplies we provided backpacks and all the supplies they would need for five weeks. So everything they needed from notepads to pens to markers, anything they would need for the five weeks was in in their backpack when they started the program. And we did not provide them with the backpack until they showed up for the first day of class. So, uh, and all, all the students had, we, we had navigators that were basically responsible for 17 students. And uh, they, would, they would have to make sure the students got here. They would call when students missed. They would also go on field trips with them. And basically they were, they were the ones that took care of those students. And they sort of uh, helped build the sense of belonging for the, for the students. So the students checked in with the navigators every day. And if they, wouldn't, if they were not doing their homework or not, not participating in class, the navigator would be the one that's that would uh, say, would ask them to, uh, you know, talk to them about it and motivate them in that way. Uh, we also had free tutoring that the navigators also made sure students that needed the tutoring would go. And uh, so we put a lot of responsibility on the navigators and we offered free tutoring. And we also had uh, laptops for every student in the program. And we provided um, hotspots to all, uh, to all students that didn't have it at home. So this was very important uh, to the program. And uh, I think that, um, that navigator played a very serious role in, in the success of our program. We had a 96% uh, attendance rate based on our navigators calling and making a real big deal of the of students who would miss or be late. So that was a real big deal for us. So uh, if you can go to the next slide, it'd be great. Okay, so uh, students, uh, as far as the attendance, this was, well, we, we expected students to come every day. Each day you would miss, we would, we would, it would be, uh, you'd have to, we, we provide the students with a stipend at the end. And if you missed a day or missed something, uh, you know, it was a percentage of your, uh, your stipend was taken away. So uh, that's, that was one of the reasons the students used to always come up and say, hey, uh, I got to go to this, you know, and they had to figure out, if, is, is it worth $25 for you to, to not be in class? And so we provided a, a little stipend for them at the end, if they complete the program. And, um, so it was really, it was really, really important for them to be prompt and, and, and to be prepared when they went to the classroom every day, the classroom, the classroom environment. Uh, we, 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 we set an expectation there as well for students not to have headphones on and, and, and be on the internet and doing stuff that was unrelated to what was, what was going on in the classroom. Uh, each student was provided with a, um, with a navigator. They were expected to meet with this navigator, respond to the navigator as they called them, as they, uh, looked at the expectation that they had for them. They, we wanted the student to really dig into that navigator and navigator to really get into the students as well, where they, uh, you know, sort of provided, um, that was like their person when they were on campus. So we didn't have to deal with a lot of, a uh, lot of things from my standpoint, navigator sort of handled all those things. So, um, but again, the navigator made sure that the students made it to at, at school after, after, uh, after afternoon activities, they would, like I said, they would go along with them as well. They would also uh, look at their progress and, and sort of motivate them that way as well. So, um, and again, if you came in late or, uh, you know, or you, you were absent, then, uh, you know, a percentage was taken away from you, unless you had a, unless you had a real big excuse not to be there. 
So, but again, the classroom, the field trips, everything had percentages on it. And so we really want to make sure that the students realize that their participation and everything was highly important. Uh, next slide, Brian, please. Okay, and also at the end of the, at the, end of the program, uh, well, let me, let me start with this. We'd have campus resources. We, we, we would have financial aid, uh, scholarship uh, information sessions. Um, we, um, yeah, Brian, I'll get to that question in a second. Uh, we provided job training opportunities, uh, for the students if they wanted to go in that trio services. And these were, these were all after af afternoon activities that students had to participate in as, as well as their parents. So their parents had to come to these sessions as well. And we also had a celebration banquet, which, uh, students look forward to. We took the students to, uh, Michigan adventures as well. And that was part of the setup to complete the program, as well as a stipend that we provided. Uh, we served probably around 250 students and, uh, and it was, you know, at, each year it got bigger and bigger as different counselors found out about it. It was, uh, it just got bigger and bigger. Uh, the banquet we had, it was mandatory for parents to show up. Um, and, uh, it was, it was just, it was just a, it was a right thing to do for the kids. And I think that they brought, they bring along their brothers and sisters. So they sort of saw, uh, them complete the program. So that was great for us and great for the students. And then it, it, it also provided our, um, our uh, what should I say, our um, our program got more popular and popular as, as people found out about it. So uh, we posted these pictures on social media and that really helped out a lot. Uh, let me go back to your question, Brian. Okay. There's about a total number of participants in the program. Okay. Yeah, about two. Yeah, about two hundred fifty. Uh, the first year was probably one hundred twenty, and then we dropped up to two fifty. And and last year we we had um, we had a uh, interest of like three hundred fifty, but we couldn't take them all, so we didn't have the funding to do that. So, um, okay, stipend after the first year. Okay, we and we did not use the stipend after the first year for an incentive. So uh, at this point, I'd like to open up for any any questions if you guys have any. Um, Dave, we could talk just a little bit before we open it up to the for some early okay. results that we saw. We, you know, we did some post and pre-survey results. Um, as I mentioned, you know, some of our yes. goals. We did see some increase. We saw significant increases in two areas that we were really happy to see um, yeah. confidence in math, English, and writing. Again, not the huge improvements in um, skills necessarily, but significant in in confidence and um, uh, desire and readiness to go to college and navigate the various resources. We did use some placement testing initially to assist with instruction. Um, we didn't have the detailed tracking set up right away to determine um, how much student test scores improved. Um, anecdotally, and what we do have, we did see that quite a few students improved a um, uh, placement test after completing the, the program. Yep, and also uh, they also showed knowledge of, of, of college resources as well. Uh, they showed improvements there and also about how to navigate the financial aid situation and, and apply for scholarships. So they also sort of showed a confidence in knowing how to do those things as well. So we, at, at the beginning of the year, like the first day, the first week, we sort of, uh, brought out a survey and asked them these questions as far as what they knew and uh, about how their confidence level was. And a lot of them uh, said they had no confidence in in in, uh, in post-secondary at all. And, and they, they weren't sure that, that was the right thing for them to do. And so after going through the program, we did see some rise in that number. So um, again, so make sure you do a survey at, at the beginning of the program to, to find out what they, they do and do not know or what their confidence levels are. Dave, there's a question. Um from Holly at Muskegon about decreasing uh, participation rates when the stipend was offered. I don't. I think we actually saw our numbers go up each yeah. year. Um, you know, the key to that, Holly and Dave, this was really one of Dave's great um, strengths, is really recruiting through the high schools and through the families. Yeah. Um, you know, really selling the, um, the benefit, the readiness. Um, you know, we allowed students who we gave the students the laptops that they were allowed to use as long as they were enrolled at GRCC. Um, so those were the types of holistic um, pieces 
um, that, that made it a, a appealing to students and especially to families. So we really didn't see the completion rates decrease. You know, one of the reasons, um, you know, we did not have set aside funding for this. The first year we did it, it was extra dollars and the, and the president and I were really supportive of moving forward in this way. But as we moved along each year, we had to find ways um, to cut some of the pieces of the program to make it run because we knew it was an important program. So. Um, you know, I think as we look at our budget for this year, we might think about including some some different things that we took out or wanted to but couldn't because of money. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And um, and again, uh, students, you know, the parents really pushed the students and the counselors pushed the students to that they thought could benefit from, from this program the most. And that's how we really got them. And uh, we also, uh, Brian sent out a, a letter to all the superintendents letting them know about this program and they would funnel that down to the buildings. And so I think that would help with our recruitment as well. Uh, something that you may want to do is let them know, let the superintendents know of the, of the various districts that you're gonna be recruiting from. Uh, let me see what else. Brian, I, did I miss anything? As far as um, recruitment wise, we um, we used, uh, we had high school uh, counselor visits uh, where we actually went in and promoted this program. And uh, that seemed to really help a lot. And uh, we also um, sent out uh, letters to the different homes uh, asking, let, letting the parents know about it. And uh, I thought that that really helped with our recruiting as well. So each year, word of mouth really helped as well so um people talk and they you know if they have a good experience they'll they'll share that with, with their different relatives and friends and so i thought that was one of the things that helped us as well dave there's a question about the percentage that was online versus in person and i i don't know off the top of my head what that right is. uh I, I would say 75 percent of students were in seat um it may have been 25 percent that were online but that's sort of majority of students were here and that's what we really pushed. Um, and, uh, you know, so that was, that was sort of the breakdown. It would probably be 75, 25, something, something of that nature. Is there any more questions on the chat? No, I think we're yeah. caught up in the chat. Okay, great. Um, good. Well, I'll shut up and sort of listen to what um, you guys have to ask at this point. My question has to do with, I, I mean, I could see how a program like this might be really effective at a urban campus where a large percentage of the students are win, within a big area. When you're talking about rural colleges where your schools and school system may be 50, 60, 70 miles away, um, transportation is an issue, not having food service on campus is an issue. Uh, how are these things going to be able to be met under the state law at rural campuses, or is it even feasible for rural campuses? So, so I'm going to jump in and answer that one for, and I, because I, because that's that's how it's a really good segue. I do want to give people a chance to ask anything specific about the GRCC program that you didn't understand or that they can clarify for you now. Um, and then we're going to transition to the, the completely understandable question of, of how you would translate this program into um, other contexts, because, of course, there are a number of different contexts across the state. Um, and we've put some time and thought into um, us and our, our advisory committee and Erica and myself have put a lot of questions, put a lot of thought into how we might be able to address some of these things going forward. Dave, there's a question about um, hybrid. I think the first year it was hybrid. Students did both. After that, did students have the choice? I thought we had, when you said 75, 25, 75 percent of the program was in person and 25 was online, yeah, and virtual. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So all students had a component of either, and I think that percentage started to um, lean more towards um, in person as we got further away from from COVID. Yeah. Well said, Brian. Yes, Stacy. Mm -hmm. And the way the program was pro was promoted, as we got further away from COVID, we sort of we sort of marketed to be in seat. So, 
and that's that was sort of the expectation so All right. Thanks so much, David and Brian. I appreciate you sharing about your program and um, look forward uh, to, uh, oh, Erica has raised her hand. Or no, I'm just... clapping. Oh, you're clapping. I see. I can't tell. The icons are you're... too small. Update your emojis, Jenny. <laughs> We're happy to provide. I know we've shared the PowerPoint. I know some of you have, have reached out. Um, to me, we're all, you know, we're always happy to provide as much information as we can. And I'm going to go ahead and then start with the translation, translating this to um, kind of the broader context of all of Michigan Community Colleges. Let's see. Um, I don't remember why. Okay, um, so now we're gonna talk about, for, well, first of all, I wanna take you before I actually go through with how to apply, I wanna take you to the academic program, catch up program website, um, which is accessible from the MCCA uh, homepage. Um, it's this, this is kind of our, this, this includes resources for how colleges can offer this program. Um, again, it goes over the things that I already went over, um, the program requirements, the application is here, and we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Um, there's an estimated budget, so you can actually click on this budget for each college and you can look up how much money your college may be eligible for with your, you know, with the base allocation of 83,000 and additional um, money based on a student allocation per student. Per student. Um, and I'm gonna go here to the frequently asked, well, first, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the resource. No, I'll get to that later. I'm gonna go to the frequently asked questions because I think hey, some of um, the things you Jenny, if I can them. interrupt, I think you're yeah. sharing your PowerPoint slides and not the website. Oh, it didn't go. Mm -hmm. Darn. Ah, oh, poop. I think you have to un yeah, unshare the. Okay, and that. share again. Okay, I can do that. All right. I am here at the frequently asked questions page. Um, but if I go back, you can see the academic catch up program page with the information that I just said it was going to be there. Um, so let's talk about the frequently asked questions. Um, so one of the frequently asked questions is, are you required to participate? You are not required to participate in the program. Um, the hope is that everybody will be able to take advantage of this and offer a program, um, but you're not required to participate. Um, Besides the money that you, the funding that you will get to offer the program, it's an excellent recruiting opportunity, as I think you heard from the folks at um, GRCC. Uh, do you have to offer a program in the summer? Yes. The, the legislation requires that the program be offered during the summer. Um, that's the minimum. Um, you can offer the program at other times during 2023. Do we have to wait for summer 2023 to begin offering the program? If you have a program that's ready to go and you want to do a short boot camp program of this nature and you ready, you're ready to roll with it now, um, you can start anytime, but you just have to be able to offer it in 20, 2023 summer. You don't need to limit enrollment to students at your college. You should, in fact, you cannot. It has to be open to any incoming college student, no matter where they are intending to go. Um, we talked a little bit with uh, Brian and David about the hybrid program. Um, the legislation says that you have to provide in-person and online options, and that can be and probably would be most effective as a hybrid model. Um, you, so although you may want to emphasize in-person instruction, as they did at GRCC, you do have to also um, include online as an option. 
here's a big question, and and this this kind of touches on the credit offering um, issue, and that is, uh, can it include developmental education pro courses? For example, can I use my developmental education courses that I've scheduled for the summer? Um, as the instructional component of this program? And the answer is yes, you can enroll. You know, If you have developmental courses in an accelerated format um, and you want to make them part of the program, as long as you do not charge the students um, and the courses are um, wrapped around with all of the other required components, and students who don't who complete the program are not enrolled in non co-requisite developmental education courses after they complete the program, you can use your, you know, the your existing scheduled developmental education courses, but you cannot collect tuition or fees for them. Um, but you can't just do that. You have to include the um, other required wraparound components: the uh, the 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 classroom supplies, the transportation support the um you know the individualized um instruction or uh college knowledge components um basic needs components things like that um you can use place can you use placement testing um and uh, brian referenced this you can use placement testing um but you cannot use placement test scores to place students into a standalone developmental education course once they have completed the summer program, they have to be at the very minimum in, in a gateway course with co-requisite support. But that doesn't mean you can't use the testing in ways like Brian said, the, you know, the pre-post testing or other, um, other utilization of testing. You can use um, their GPA to talk to them about whether or not they should take the courses with or without uh, co-requisite support when they enroll. Um, so you can use test, you can use testing, but you cannot use it to place students in standalone developmental ed courses. Um, when will the funds be available in to colleges? I think we will not be cutting a check in December of 2022. We should have updated this. Um, but but maybe Erica has more information on that. We we hope to be able to get you some funds as soon as possible once we finish with the application process and then they'll come in two uh installments one um right away as soon as possible and then one in may after we have evidence that you are in fact running the program in summer of 2023 we'll have an mou a grant agreement for you um and there will be uh some reporting requirements and there'll be more about that later in the the season as we as we start to get more of a um a, our, our arms wrapped around those requirements from the state what can we use the money for so here's some of the things that came up in the chat questions um certainly you can use funding for direct program costs including the access to laptop computers software textbooks the funding for transportation, um, the answer to the question, you know, if you don't have a robust public transportation infrastructure in your town, you certainly can use some of the funding to provide uh, cash cards for gas. Checking sheet. Um, no. Nope. I just. The uh, uh, grocery assistance cards, basic needs any of those things you might also consider providing the financial incentives to students. Um, like uh, Brian talked about, they did in G at GRCC. Um, you can use the funds to pay for administrative overhead. Could be that you need a program administrator or coordinator. Can be um, applied to other areas of college operate. You know, you can you can use funds to shore up budgets where you've had to borrow personnel or borrow time. Um, certainly, program faculty and staff instruction. Um, but also advisors, navigators, financial aid staff, basic needs specialists. Um, it could be an overload contract or a temporary personnel contract or indirect support for personnel costs to re, you know, to make your budget whole as you borrow people out of those areas. Um, you can use funds for marketing and student recruitment, and you should. 
Um, you can use the funds to identify and target the 2020 to 2023 high school graduates, maybe through visits or, you know, particularly for those 2023 graduates, maybe through school visits, but other marketing materials or students who are, you know, you find um, in local GED programs or through your workforce development office. Um, you can use funds for data collection and program evaluation, um, like the kind of evaluation um, that the GRCC folks described, the pre-post surveys, the analysis um, of, you know, where students enroll and how they did, things like that. And also you can use funds for continuing support in fall 2023 when these students complete and enroll with you, um, they may continue to uh, need support and you can, can, you can use funds to continue to support the students. Can I help you understand the budget for colleges chart? Yes, I can. I will go back to that. Okay, so we're going to go. Um, yeah. We have a couple questions in the chat that I want to make sure that we address. Um, Amy from LMC says they use a pickup system with a college van for help with transportation. Um, we, you know, that, that would be an allowable expense for, uh, to get students to the program if you're doing that. Um, and then Amy asked, uh, I think this is related to the in-person versus the virtual instruction. And Amy said, meaning you need to stream face-to-face -face sessions. I don't know if you, Amy, if you want to provide us some additional context there. Thank you. When I read that, to me, it sounds as if you need to offer the offer the sessions both online and face to face, meaning you'd stream the face to face. Right. Um, whereas a hybrid, at least the way we do it at LMC, is more like some sessions are face to face and some sessions are high, are online. So I just wanted some clarification on what the actual wording is specifying there. That's a really that that's a really good question that I think we haven't completely answered. Erica, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think we, I think I think there, that's open to some interpretation on the part of the colleges. Um, the idea of the hybrid, where some where there's some instruction online and some instruction in person, probably will work well for most students. But the legislation does say that you need to be, have both online and face-to-face. -face. I don't know, Erica, if we need to follow up with someone on that. Yeah, why don't we take that down and follow up on it? Um, I think the idea being we wouldn't want, the, the state wouldn't want students to be excluded from the program because it was exclusively in person or exclusively online. Um, but right. we, can, we can take that back and get more clarification. Mm -hmm. Um, Victor asked, uh, from WCC, can students take the bridge program at a college and enroll in a different college the following fall? I think the answer to that has to be yes, because the idea is that the programs are supposed to be available to students wherever they are. The idea of offering these programs at community colleges was that students would be able to take them even if they were enrolling at a university, if they were leaving town and, and going out of town for a, yep. to a different university or a different community college. Jenny, so I have a question for you. So um, you're saying that one, they can offer a stipend, uh, mm -hmm. complete the program, and yes. two, that we could offer, we could do this on a continuous basis throughout the throughout the school year to make sure that students are staying, staying enrolled and those kind of things so we can continue to support. Over yes. The school year. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I mean, the, the the funding is is intended to be spent within the twenty within twenty twenty three. It's a one year program. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you. At this time, anyway. Yeah. Um, Greta, there is not is not the minimum number of hours of English and math, um, are not specified. That's I think that that's at your discretion. Thanks, Jenny. I think that was all from the chat. Okay. And then I will go and we'll look at the budget sheet because there was a question about helping understand the budget sheet. Mm -hmm. 
And now I'm going to have to stop sharing and start again, aren't I? Okay. Jenny learns things about Zoom after three years. Okay. <laughs> so the budget sheet for the colleges. Um, each cut for each college. There's the base, you'll see the base allocation is the same. And then what we did is we took the total number of high school graduates that you enrolled, the, the you know, graduates from 2020, 2021, and 19 and 20 to get kind of an average over two years of the number of students that you might expect to come from your local high schools to your college. And we took the average of those two years, and then we estimated that you would serve um, a certain percentage of them. What was the percentage, Erica? Do you remember? I mean, you can see like we, um, Alpina has an average total high school graduates that they serve of 165. And the expectation is that with their program, they would serve 41 students. Approximately 25% of yes. the average high school graduates over those two years, which is uh, aligns with um, uh, GRCC's uh, incoming class and the percentage of students that were served through that program. Right. You can see the, the numbers for GRCC down here. So um, larger colleges get a you know, are expected to serve a larger number of students. You you can serve more students um, in your, with your program, certainly. Um, but the expectation is you would serve, uh, you know, and 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 the ex and for the very for our, our very small colleges, tribal colleges, and et cetera, where the expectation would be, you know, that you might your average number of incoming students is less than ten. Like you look at the the um, Keweenaw Bay here. Um, we expect a minimum of 15 students to be served. Mm -hmm. um, the per student amount is the number is is the the number of students times the amount that it's expected to cost to serve the student. And I think we can go into more detail um, if people have specific questions about how the total estimated award was arrived at. For your college, I think the best thing to do would be to reach out to us by email. One concern I have that just got brought up, but this question that was just on the chat, um, if students can go from one college to another, and yet they didn't complete the program at the college, are you saying that the college that then accepts that student has to put that student in non-developmental English and math programs and waive their prerequisites and all their, because uh, that that is probably going to cause some heartburn with faculty at my institution. So first of all, it's supposed to be, it only requires that students who complete the program are right. not, cannot be enrolled in Right. Standalone developmental classes. They can be enrolled in co-requisite classes. Sure, but we don't have co-requisite classes. We really have standalone classes. So you, I mean, you have standalone we developmental have classes? Our, 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 our work on like Michigan Reconnect and everything, we've used the accelerated model in math and we don't right. have, and we don't have a mandatory placement in English. So there's no problem. A student can always select the, wow. uh, the, the English class self-placement. So okay. the question comes, if a student completes this, let's say at Montcalm Community Colleges and come to Mid-Michigan College, do we then have to enroll them in the college level math class because they did complete the program at a different college? Um, 
I would say that the 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 sense of the legislation is yes. That that's but we cannot really control what happens when when students go from college to college and we don't I mean there's no there's no mechanism there's no transcript for this program. Right. Right. So um I think that that that's a that that would be dependent on the uh on the goodwill of the colleges with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there something else here? Okay, does that, Chris, does that cover you, your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, a couple people are, uh, want to reach out about the, their, the calculations. Oops. Uh, Could I ask a question really quick? This is Kathleen LaValle, sure. you're at Community College. Sure. Is, I'm sorry if I missed this. Is there a data tracking um, tool or a required data tracking for this program? Or just what our institution would normally use? Or is there a collective data tracker? Yeah. I'm just there are some data there are some reporting requirements that we've just received recently from the state that we're still working through so we will be asking you um to to keep track of the students who complete the program yes there and we'll be creating a template so it'll you know with with kind of basic demographic information um it shouldn't be a heavy lift it should be the kind pretty simple kind of tracking that um you might do automatically anyway mm -hmm. Jenny, I would say um, once we get the applications back from colleges and we wanted to have this session today to capture any of your questions, um, once we receive your application and then you know, have a better sense of who plans to participate in this, we will have that grant agreement. And at that time, we'll also be able to share with you what data we'll be collecting from you. Um, it will, as Jenny said, it it's it's, we're, we, we typically will not be asking for information that you don't collect from students. We also will be asking for data primarily in aggregate. We won't be asking for individual level student data through this program at all. Um, if we're unable to reach, Clarence asks, if we're unable to reach the targeted number of students, will colleges be, be required to return any funding? Our, our anticipation is that once we are ready to release the second check that you'll have a pretty good idea of whether or not you're going to reach the target number. Um, that that and so hopefully that hopefully we won't come to that if we were to give all you all the money right now, then then that might be an issue, but hopefully by the time we're coming around to giving you the second check you'll have a pretty good idea about whether or not you're going to hit the target. Um, there was we do anticipate that if you think, you know, if you had a pretty high target and you are not going to be able to get to it, um, we will adjust that second check. Mm -hmm. um, Jenny, I'll also add, when we calculated those estimated numbers, um, you'll notice that we averaged one high school graduating class. And I'll just reinforce now that we would really encourage colleges to not only enroll students from one high school graduating class, but from multiple high school graduating classes. So um, this could go, uh, obviously, um, this would be targeted at students who experience learning loss due to COVID-19 pandemic, which obviously goes back to 2020. But we wouldn't prevent you from enrolling students in the program who graduated from high school before 2020. Or who were, you know, yeah, who were Michigan Reconnect students even or other, you know, there, so you're not, we won't be asking you what high school, well, we may ask you, I suppose, how many students you from 2023, but that will not be the, that will not have to do with the target number of students that you serve. You'll still be able to count students who did not graduate from high school in 2023. Yes, Amy. There was a question earlier that I don't think was directly addressed regarding credit. So I know this has to be offered for free to everyone, but is it possible to also offer a potential credit option 
just because we kind of already have a model where we do that. And I wonder how those two things might work together. So would you would you be giving the student the credit for free? Or maybe it could be an optional thing where they also sign up to take to get the credit in addition. So they could do it for free without credit, or they could maybe use financial aid or some other, you know, whatever financial mechanism they would sign up for classes to get the credit in addition to the free offered sessions. I, I'm not sure how the legislative language of the state budget office would view that. I think you'd probably have to have a pretty strong firewall between the program being offered for free and students having an option to register into something for credit. So I, I would think that you wouldn't want the program to look like you're enticing students into it and then asking them to, to enroll for credit and use their financial aid. Right. I guess I'm thinking for a lot of colleges that don't have this type of program already, this is a lot of work to build something like this. And, and this is a one-year program, right? So I think all of us that are are probably interested in doing this would want to continue because this is a great program. We've been doing something like this for years and um, and it's needed. And so even though this is a great opportunity to get a good head start on something and have some additional funding, I would think it's something that people would want to have some way of thinking about how they would continue it. And so I guess we'd just have to be clear, hey, this is free this year, but next year we're going to offer it for credit. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think that as long as and and this this addresses um, the question Michelle just popped into, as long as the program as it is described in the legislative language is offered completely free of charge to students this year, then you can you know then then there's. Then, then there's flexibility around what you can do. Certainly flexibility around what you can do next year. There's no requirements for next year. I just would be cautious to say, hey, it's free, you know, this for this program to, to market it as, hey, it's free, but we also have some things that you can enroll in and use your financial aid because I think that the state budget office would look kind of askance at that because then it's not a free program. Then it's you know, something else. And just to be clear, this this funding is for this year only. So if you if you wanted to do the program again next summer, we won't have the funding necessarily available for that, um, in which case it would be entirely up to your institution how you want to pay for the program. Um, but as Michelle asked, Michelle stated, I think it can be credit or not for credit. And you can do it, but it ha both of those situations have to be for free at least this year, right? To the student. And we're at the top of the hour, so I understand if people need to um, uh, go, um, Richard. I don't. I. I, think I so. mean, I. I get, however you want to pay for the instruction, you can. So if you want, but so if you are saying if you want to say this is how much it would cost to offer the program if we were charging tuition for it and that fits into your budget and you can serve the number of students that you're targeted to do, that's fine. We're not gonna ask you how you arrived at the cost. Right. I like the bake sale idea. Um, I, I do wanna just quickly, if you have to go, I understand, but I want, before we go, I, I have not had a chance to tell you about the application which is um, due on January 31st. And it's not a very hard application. It should not take you a long time to complete it, um, especially now that we've sort of talked through this. Um, it's, a, it's a Google form. So you select your college, you agree that you will comply with the requirements, which are exactly the same as the ones I read you at the beginning. Um, if you're not going to be able to do one of those things, but you still want to participate, then we're going to look for a rationale for why that requirement really doesn't work for your college. Um, but if you can't, if, if you're not, if, if your rationale is not 
judged to be adequate by our um, advisory committee, you may not be awarded funding through the program. Um, and of course, I can't walk you through the application because I didn't fill it out. All right, I'm just gonna pretend I'm Grand Rapids and I'm gonna pretend that I am definitely gonna do all these things. So we can go on to page two. And then I'm gonna go next. All right, um, and then we're gonna ask you about um, your, whether you have an existing program, you don't have to have one. Um, but if you do, we wanna know about it. So, and then brief, briefly describe it, um, link to the website. And then finally, we have the, uh, we are gonna be offering some uh, workshops to support colleges in um, who are participating. So we so in the first one will be on uh, February 7th. You can see all this on the uh, the page, the website, which is now gone. Oh, because I always went to the so you can see the topics of the uh, the workshops follow along with um, the requirements in the legislation. So the one on February 7th will be, and these are going to be much more conversational. So we'll have more time to talk about your questions, like how to offer, how do you want to offer the developmental education? How are other people doing it? Thank you, Erica, for putting those in the chat. Um, and, you know, we'll have a session with Precious on basic needs. We'll have some time and who, and again, these, those, these are going to be more conversational and intended to promote cross-college sharing more so than, um, you know, me talking through and trying to present this, this session was intended to be sort of an info dump. Um, my main thing that I want to leave you with is that we hope that you all do want to participate and find a way to participate because we want to reward the legislature for, um, you know, addressing what they are perceiving as a student need issue with actual funding for colleges and despite the fact that there is some prescriptiveness in this, um, it's fairly generous funding. So hopefully you will all find a way to, to participate, to apply for it. And um, please reach out to me if you have any questions and I will farm them out to other people who know more than me um, and hopefully be able to get back to you. We will look at the, the budget spreadsheet and see what seems to have gone wrong. Um, and we will get those corrected. And is there any final, oh, the application form is located at, on the website. The, hang on, I'm gonna put the, that back in the chat if Erica hasn't done it already by the time I get there. There's where the, there, there is where the application is and there is where the answer to all of those, you'll find the frequently asked questions and the soon to be corrected budget worksheet. And anything else for the good of the order before we go? I'm sorry that I kept you after. Thanks, Amy. Appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday evening. <laughs>